Ryan Rucco, the uh, night off tonight. He's with me now on the Sports Bash 97.3 ESPN. Ryan, welcome back. How are you? Good, Mike. Thanks for having me back, man. Pleasure, man. Uh, you know, the NBA is so interesting now in that if you're not, like, really good, fan bases are almost accepting that they want you to be really bad. How, how odd is that? <laughs> you know what? You're so right. I, I think that uh, this is sort of just the evolution of the knowledge of the sports fan, right? And I think it is in some ways uh, a byproduct of having, you know, more outlets and more access than ever before. And, and I even think about it in the way that I saw, you know, Yankees fans accept their rebuild this past year, right? And like selling at the trade deadline. And everybody thought, oh, the Yankees could never do that. But the reality is these fans get it. You know, they're sophisticated fans, they're knowledgeable, and they have more access to learning about younger players than ever before. And I think that, you know, that was just one example of what we see also with NBA fan bases. They realize that, you know, ultimately the goal is to win a championship. And there are only but a few ways to go about that in a league that, you know, the talent is often harbored in just a couple of places when, it talk, when we're talking about, you know, championship level, uh, you know, talent compilations. And I, I think that, you know, they get it. You know, they're constantly hearing uh, from a variety of different sources on Twitter or, you know, on the radio or TV or whatever it might be, um, this sort of long-term outlook. And, and I just feel like there's no longer the common fan with his head in the sand. No, I want to win now. I think that fans just, they're really, really informed now and they get it. And the realization that in the NBA, of all the sports in the NBA, if you're the eight seed, seven, six, five, you ain't winning the thing. I mean, you're not right. winning. Even if you upset a team and won a series, a eight, seven, six, five over 82 games is there for a reason. They're not winning four series in a row. And I think fans have realized that, the, the smart fans anyway. Yes, it, and I think you are 100% right about that. They understand that, you know, you're not winning the finals with one of those seeds. But I think sometimes you have to be careful not to go too far to where you don't value the postseason at all. I mean, first of all, you know, from a business standpoint, these franchises are still – operating as a business and the playoffs do provide them great value right and even if you take a look at you know the Atlanta Hawks in recent years yeah did we ever think they had a chance of winning the title no but there's value to be in the playoffs year after year financially and for you know the branding of your franchise and and engaging people the other part of it is if you are trying to develop a championship team sort of that fine line between what's more valuable giving the players you already have in tow playoff experience or getting the best pick possible as you continue to grow. A team like New Orleans is sort of in that place right now, right? Like, yeah. do you want to go be the eighth seed and be a sacrificial lamb? Or even Minnesota, maybe that's a better example because they have a, a more you know unified young core. You know, are they better off getting some playoff experience for Andrew Wiggins and Zach Levine and Carl Anthony Towns and even, you know, Shabazz Muhammad and Gorgie Jang? Uh, or are they better off missing – you know, what would you know likely be a four or five game first round loss to the Warriors and getting a top 10 pick potentially that can grow with those other young players. And I don't know that there's always a right answer there. I think it kind of depends on your group and what they need. But I think the one thing fans need to be aware of is, you know, just because you are going to be a sacrificial lamb in the first round of, you know, the playoffs one year doesn't mean it won't provide dividends down the road for your growing young core. Yeah, I, I agree with that, that there's a certain team and a certain time where the experience is beneficial, and there are other teams where the, where they need to, to start, you know, like a Knicks team, is, unfortunately they don't have any picks, but their, yeah. benef their benefit it would be to not be a playoff team, and if they had picks uh, and, and start to get younger, uh, being a playoff team for them it doesn't help them much. Unfortunately, they don't have the picks to, to build, but, but you talk about business. How about the team that wins the championship? Cleveland lost $40 million last year. I mean, at some point, isn't it a scary proposition for the sport that your best team lost, to, operated at a $40 million loss? Well, yes, that's obviously not the business model that you uh, want to put forth. And I think that, you know, their new CBA, um, it, it obviously encourages – balance and if you're going to go above and beyond your luxury taxes and that you're going to have to pay but the one thing that doesn't account for necessarily is what it does for you moving forward you know mm -hmm. i remember 
when uh, when I used to talk to um, people in uh, successful front offices in baseball, they used to always have this common thing where they talk about winning a championship was usually would usually have like a ten year sort of reverberation uh, that would be a positive impact on them economically and you may not see that immediately, you know, but it's sort of like investing to, you know, pay off down the road. And I don't know how that exactly translates for the Cavaliers, but I would guess that they do feel like that'll end up making sense business-wise for them. Even if in a given year, they ended up spending a lot more money than they were expecting to or, or would like to have to in a year where they had so much success. Uh, Ryan Rucco is with us. Um, you know, uh, here locally, Embiid has dominated the conversation. Now, he hasn't played yeah. for a little while because of this, uh, you know, bone bruise, although he played on your network, uh, what, last Friday night, and uh, yeah. that, that was entertaining, right? 32 points. So it seemed like he was okay. Now he hasn't played since that night. So there's been a lot of speculation that, well, they only played him because they were on national television. There's been a lot of this uh, – pull and back and forth with the fans and this whole situation here with the 76ers, but um, it seems that they are going out of their way to protect this guy, right? I mean, that they are doing everything possible to make sure that they don't overstep their boundaries with him. And you know what? I think it's so important that they do, as frustrating as it is, especially with the momentum the Sixers have been building um, prior to this uh, little setback. Yeah, 10-5 and Um, in January. Yeah, and the excitement, and you—I mean, you know it better than me, Mike. But you could feel it with the fan base. It's palpable in the area. You know, they're a story. They're an interesting watch. It's a reason why you know we flexed to that Sixer game. That was not normally on our schedule. And you know, of course, James Harden had a lot to do with that too. But you know, the Sixers were a draw for us. And I forget the game we flexed off of for it, but it wasn't like a bad game. You know, it was just—it was more emblematic of how interesting we found both the Harden-Houston story and the Embiid-Philly story. But the thing that I think Philly fans should feel good about is just because it's all sort of, you know, coming together in a fun, exciting way now doesn't mean that the organization is going to lose sight of what the longer-term goal is here, even if they weren't the ones who were implementing it over the last few years. They get it. You know, they, they understand that, this is not about what you can do this season. This is about trying to build for, you know, two years from now, three years from now, four years from now, and protecting Embiid is of paramount importance to make that happen because he is the reason you have that hope. If he goes away, none of this matters again. You know, all of a sudden you're back in the same place that you were. This guy is the franchise guy you've been waiting for, and you're not winning a championship this year, which means there is nothing more important than keeping him healthy. You know, I I liken it almost, Mike, to what happened with Steven Strasburg a few years ago and Matt Harvey two seasons ago, right? Like, when the Nationals rested Strasburg and he couldn't pitch in that postseason, I didn't agree with it because I thought about it from a standpoint of, if you're a baseball player, this is the pinnacle of what you want to achieve in your career. It's on the doorstep. You don't punt on that right now when it can be had, right? And that's the same reason why I was cool with Matt Harvey blowing through his innings limit. And obviously he got hurt last year, but because he was, you know, he's in the World Series. Like, if you're not going to go all out then, then when are you? What are you saving yourself for? In this case, there is no delusion about Philly being on the brink of a championship. So it's best to play it as safe as you have to with Joel Embiid because in a couple of years they might be on the brink of a championship with him. Ryan Rucco, uh, you you go all over, you see all the teams. Uh, I... I... I think Colangelo's in a tough spot with Okafor. That type of player, why very talented. I mean, this guy had 17-7 and seven last year as a rookie. He looked like a handful. I, I think his explosion is gone. He looks like a different player. Mentally, he doesn't look confident at all. That type of player doesn't seem to have a role in today's NBA. I don't know what they do with him. I know. It, it, it's tough, right? But, you know, I you know I do Nets games as well, obviously, and, and we – see this to a certain degree with Brooke Lopez, right? Like, Brooke is still, and he's not the same player as Okafor, but he's just at like, least got you know, a three-point shot and added that to his game. He, he, he You know, he added that. He did. He did. And that's a, that's a new revelation this year, which has definitely made him fit into um, today's offense better, no doubt. Um, but, I, you know, the, the one thing I'd say, now, Okafor may not fit 
with this team, right, because of Embiid. You know, and if you're building around Embiid, can Okafor really play with him and can they be on the floor at the same time? I think up to this point, we all kind of feel like probably not, right? And so he may not be the best fit for this team, but that doesn't mean he's not a fit for the league because at some point, you know, when everybody else is going one way, if you have an asset that goes the other and can do it really well, that's not the worst thing in the world. It is a little bit of what San Antonio has done over these last two years, right? They've seen everybody kind of going one direction, and they decided, hey, you know what? We're going to take advantage of our size inside, and we're going to try and pound you on the offensive glass, and we're going to have, you know, bigs that pass really well out of the high post. And, yeah, we may take more twos than some other teams, but they're going to be in rhythm, and they're going to be open, and they're going to be in the flow of our offense, and we're going to take advantage of the assets we do have. So I think that talent and skill still has a place. I, I just am not sure if that place is with this Philadelphia 76ers team. Doesn't look like it. Uh, looks like square peg round hole here uh, for yeah. uh, poor Okafor, unfortunately, and he doesn't play very good defense. That He's going to have – you know, I think – He's like Cantor. He would be a good fit in that spot. Now Cantor is there, although he yeah. broke his hand. But that's the kind of team that needs an Okafor. That's one that's accepting and willing that he's not going to play defense. And Brett Brown mm-hmm. doesn't seem accepting or willing. You know what? That's actually a really good example, Mike. It's like if you can have that guy, that big, who comes off the bench and can just wreck second-team centers you yep. know, uh, on offense, fine because honestly defensively they're not going to need to do as much because they're not going to be going up against the same caliber of talent but what you have to make sure you know you were just talking about you know Oka Ford doesn't seem like his self personality wise as well and you can understand why obviously a guy has been great forever trying to you know just find a way to give consistent minutes now that's a difficult mental adjustment so you got to make sure that kind of player can also adjust to a role off the bench like can they actually embrace that role and be them their full selves can they have the confidence they need if they're going to be coming off the bench in that role and just trying to bludgeon second teams versus you know being a focal point which they've been for most of their lives uh ryan rucco uh nba friday night of course uh, you can watch and uh, abc tomorrow night prime time lebron and the Cavs take on the knicks uh, a lot of good nba stuff we're heating up in the nba season but can anybody beat the warriors that will unfold as we get closer to the playoffs. Ryan, enjoy the Super Bowl. Uh, enjoy the weekend. Thanks so much, Mike. Always good chatting with you, man.